Hey, what's going on? Jake here with Uncommon EDC. And I am the alien outlaw, Jesse McJames. And today we're checking out this World War One M1915 Dutch Storm Dulk. And I'm no expert on military knives and that sort of thing, but Jesse is. He's very, very passionate about this sort of stuff, and he agreed to come on and just give us a little bit of history on this, so. So to start off, um, no, I don't actually. Con I'm not actually an expert, and I've I've stated this before when I did my video with uh, Big J that um, I'm I'm fairly knowledgeable. Um, I am. I, I don't know everything about anything, but I do know some things about a few things, and this is one thing that I do a lot of research on. Um, so when Jake showed it on he and Tim's live, just the tip. Um, I knew I'd seen it before, but I didn't know a whole lot about it, but I was able to at least identify it. And then Jake and I got to talking and we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of work together on this one. Um, so you want me to go ahead and start with a little bit of history on this? Yeah, for sure. I, and we'll start with, I guess, the personal history of how I came across this one. So growing up, we had a curio in our house, all of the normal stuff in there, teapots, old coins, pewter things and a couple of knives and this was one of those knives belonged to my grandpa now he is dutch but it served in the u.s army and so this wasn't issued to him but it was something that he came across and had for all these years i saw it in the curio every day and eventually when i turned 18 my mom gave it to me so <clears throat> don't know a lot about it so yeah i would love some history on it all right so uh this is the dutch m1915 storm dolt from world war one um, it was it, it fir was first introduced in 1915 and was produced until 1940 uh, when Germany during World War II was finally able to um, overrun Holland. At what point? At which point uh, production ceased on these, and the Germans did claim did, you know found whatever surplus they found of these. They liked them enough that they kept them and made them essentially ersatz, which is kind of a replacement, replenishment. Uh, supplement to their own, basically the war effort to, to their own kit and their arsenal uh, as they could find stuff. And they really liked these. So it wouldn't have been any, you know, wouldn't have been out of place to see a World War II German uh, soldier in the Netherlands carrying one of these. Uh, but again, these were introduced in 1915 for the Dutch military, particularly from what I've heard or from what I've researched, the Marines, the Dutch Marines, um, the funny thing about that, interesting thing about that is the Netherlands was actually neutral during World War One. They felt safe with their location directly between the North Sea with Great Britain right over there and Germany on their other side. They thought they were OK being neutral, had a few incidents, but for the most part, they were able to maintain that neutrality. Um, but they still had their own military and they had to arm them. And this is one of the primary uh, hand to hand uh combat hand uh what that would uh close quarters combat hand-to-hand -hand melee weapons that they would have had so this was not like an effect you know it might have had a few um field utilitarian applications but this was primarily used for one thing and that was to inflict and incapacitate a hostile person in a defensive defensive or offensive situation as needed but yeah this, this was more this was less of a utilitarian field knife more as a direct combat, you know, up close and personal type of weapon. Right. And did they have any sort of, uh, I guess, conflicts between World War One and World War II where this would have been a little bit more heavily used? No, not particularly. Again, this was primarily from, again, from what I've been able to research, this was primarily for their own military. Now they did have some incidents, you know, they didn't come out of world war one completely unscathed. They had an, they did lose like 175 fishing vessels um, and 800 and some odd uh, fishermen to British sea mines <coughs> and German, <coughs> excuse me, German U boats, you know, uh, right. They did have one British pilot that got lost during World War One, bombed a whole town, took out, took you know, took out a family of three and damaged a lot of farmhouses. And one incident with the German army, they got too close to their border, um, and so they politely asked them to move, and they did. And then they got accused by Belgium because Belgium used to be part of the Netherlands until they seceded in 1830. Uh, but then during World War One, Belgium was 
overrun and occupied by the Germans, but the Belgian and French government accused uh, the Netherlands of helping the German army through that incident. And that just wasn't the case, but you know, politics back then. Um, but no, really, like I said, uh, the Netherlands, their constitution specifically listed that they were a neutral country. They weren't, they weren't trying to get in the middle of everybody's business. Right. Um, there was a, a, a conflict around 1830 or before that had dictated that, you know, they wanted to remain, they wanted to keep that neutrality throughout the world. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And then there's a lot of markings on here. What, when you're looking at one of these knives, what can that give you about the knife in terms of the history? So you're going to find numbers on it. You're going to find a set of serialized numbers on it. Um, that there you go. That is going to be an issue number. Now I'm not sure exactly what the C on it is. Um, but I do know that the 322, it would be the issue number that's on the finger guard. Um, typically there would be another number on the sheath, but your sheath, you know, it's definitely got some age. Um, <laughs> right. And that would be located on the back side, opposite of this side of the sheath. Um, where the rivets are on the back, there should also be right. a frog on there that would ho hold it onto the. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, and it probably looked lo something like this one. It it would look more like that, yes. Um, and there would be a metal shape at the end of the leather sheath where that ball is. That right, which of course that was missing, you know, and it would be about that long or so. Um, most of them are on the outside. I may have one handy to kind of give an example, maybe. There we go. Uh, something similar to this. This is a British P1907. So this is the shape, and it would have a very similar situation, very similar piece in the base of that sh scabbard. Whereas this one doesn't have a ball on it, that one does, and it would poke out uh, under from underneath. Which is probably why that leather is damaged right there where the tip's sticking out. Because right. that, would, that would have been a metal piece underneath the leather. That makes sense. And then when they were designing these, do we know who came up with the design? Or is it just kind of credited to? So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a stiletto design. Um, and, you know, stilettos for years have been a key piece of military. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So here's a good example of one. That's a yeah, US M3. For just a sec. Yeah, so that is a go. US M3. Very similar design. Um, now the thing about these M, these uh, stiletto design knives, uh, and we found this out in World... We ourselves, the US, found this out in World War II with the Case V42 stiletto. Um, they make great, again, close quarters combat hand-to-hand -hand melee weapons you know right it, or you know if you need to use a knife off in a, in a hostile situation uh they make they're great for that but as far as basic uh field utilitarian purposes much like the 1219c that's why we switched from the case v42 stiletto to a single-edged fixed blade with a drop point or a clip point something to that you know with um because the the fact that they were so thin on both sides with both edges, they just weren't as effective to say pry open supply crates or open ration cans or you know like with the K bars, they right. have the the pommel on it. They can use it to pound in tent stakes if they need to. Yep. So these just weren't you know these types of knives were basically designed to do to injure and incapacitate opponents. This was not a, a utility utility knife like the 1219C is. Right. And I think I had seen that maybe there was a slightly earlier version of this that had a more almost triangular tip where it was a little bit thicker. Is that right? It could have been maybe. Um, yeah. That's not one that I uncovered, but that's it, very likely that it could have been more, like you said, kind of an un, unnamed Mark I version of it. Right, and I think they switched so that they could have a little bit of a more useful tip. And in fact, that that original triangular tip might even be a war crime now because it was difficult to to stitch. Yes, that that very well could be as well. Uh, you know, you get into things like that. 
um, the uh, German uh, 9805 uh, uh, sawback butcher bayonet. Those were allegedly a war crime. Some say they were, some say they weren't because of the saw on the back. Uh, the um, U.S. military uh, trench shotgun, 10-gauge shotgun, was, you know, was considered a war crime later on. So, yeah, I mean, that's very possible. Yeah. And do we know what, what materials these would have been made of? Is it a specific type of wood, specific type of metal, or were they just using whatever steel they had to get ready? My for guess war? is it, were, it was probably a high carbon steel because you would, you, you, you know, you've got patina on here. Um, right. And primarily, you know, this was kind of before a stainless steel type era. Uh, so maybe not before a stainless steel type era, but it just wasn't as popular for this type of, of application. So this is probably a high carbon steel. Um, as far as the wood goes, I'm not, I'm, I, I, that I don't know. Um, gotcha. but yeah, probably a high car, uh, prob more than likely a high carbon steel was used for the blade and whatever tang there is in, inside of there. I think the handle has like a five eighths inch diameter on it, um, from front to back, not side to side, but I think it's like five right. eighths of an inch. So I'm not That's sure what kind of tang it would have either. Yeah, not sure. It's not super clear on the tang. It looks like it's about 13 inches long with about an 8-inch blade. In this set. Yeah, right. it should be about 13 and a quarter inches overall length from point to pommel. And like you said, an 8-inch double-edged stiletto blade. Perfect. And then there's some other markings on here. I don't know how well I captured it in the wood on the pictures, but I think we have yeah right up here at the top of the wood and then another down here that look to be identical markings do you know anything about that so that should be a crown with a z yeah this underneath the bottom one definitely is and that is an inspector's mark now there could have been there would have been different ones there could have been a crown with a b um a crown with an h and that's the only two uh there are a couple of things that I failed to mention. So, yeah, this from what I was able to research, the cr the crown with the Z is uh, the it's a well known inspector, and his name was Zwiersma. <laughs> I probably butchered that. Uh, I'm not going to try and repeat that one. What's that? I'm not going to try and repeat that one. I don't blame you. <laughs> the crown <laughs> with the B would be uh, Brassois, and the crown with the H would be Harness. I don't know if I said any of those right. So I did find something here that I apparently missed before. Um, the uh, steel is train track steel. Oh, okay. So probably high carbon steel that's going to be meant to withstand that kind of abuse, you know, would definitely right. make a very good knife. Um, and it's walnut just found that too oh good okay so yeah we got <laughs> both of those so i'm wondering it, it, who produced these was it someone where they repurposed a someone who makes stain, uh, train tracks rails or is it a dedicated company that's making knives so as far as i can tell it from what i found uh there was only one one factory that made these and that was in holland um again these were made introduced in 1915 made till 1940 when Germany was finally able to overtake Holland specifically. So from what I can tell, these were, you know, there was only one factory that made these um, and that was in Holland. I don't know that it, you know, if it had a name because like with German military knives, a lot of times you'll find the Waffen brick, the Waffen fabric on it. And that would tell you, you know, and then it would say where it was made, who it was, you know, who the maker was that type of thing. Um, but, this just isn't one that I've seen much as far as, you know, a name of the factory. That's not yeah. to say that there weren't other ones. There's just probably not much record after it was, to, after it was overrun in 1940. Right. And then I know that they're, they're making replicas of these. Now, if mm -hmm. you were to come across one, is there any tall tale signs that tell tale signs that you're looking for to identify whether this is authentic besides obviously looking brand new, you're going to, have a good sense. So of. one of the yeah, one of the things in the military collector hobby is finding forced uh forgeries, so to speak. Uh and these are people who who buy replicas. Obviously, if you buy a replica, um 
you're going to find, you know, it's going to look brand new. Not to say that you're not going to ever find mint unissued uh, examples of anything, you know, knives or what anything for that matter. Um, but you're going to, you know, it's going to be real hard to mimic uh, the maker, the inspection marks on them. Right. Um, not impossible. Nothing's impossible. But the, the inspection marks should be the very first thing you're going to look for. Um, or just any real fit and finish issues. You know, a lot of times if you've held a real one in your hand, you're going to be able to hold a, a, a replica in your hand or a fake and be able to tell the difference. Right. That makes sense. And then as far as those inspector marks, is that able to tell us a little bit about the age? Do we know like inspector z was inspecting from 1918 to 1923 or anything like that not that i've been able to find any record of but again that's not to say it's not out there uh these weren't a very you know very common commonly uh traded thing um right these stayed within the netherlands for the most part until 1940 so and then at that point you know it's not like not like the Germans were trying to save historical information or anything like that. Um, right. So, yeah, as far as all that goes, I haven't found anything specific to narrow it down to a date other than they were, you know, they were making them from 1915 to 1940. Got it. And then do we have any sense of how many of these were issued in that time period? No. Gotcha. Not that I've been able to find. <laughs> yeah, I guess they didn't keep as good a record they didn't care about the uh historical value of them when they were producing them so right um like i said the information on them is pretty much all the same you know the same all the way around um let's see yeah no like i said most of it is uh basically everything that we've talked about so far um that's about about the, there is one other thing I forgot to mention the blade itself. Um, when these were made, these were very heavily heat blued. Right. Um, and if you, and that's another thing, if you can find one in mint condition, you know, an original, the newer ones aren't going to be heat blued like that. Right. And you can still see just a little bit of bluing at the very base of the blade. Let's see if that picks up. And it definitely has that blue tin. Same thing you'd see on like a blued handgun or anything like yes. that. And so it's still present just at the top, but the rest of mine's basically worn off. Yes. All right. Uh, anything else history-wise before we kind of move on into the next category? Um, no, I think we just about covered all that. Awesome. And so another thing that I thought was pretty interesting, because for me, this was more just kind of like a family heirloom. I don't really sell knives as it is. But I was pretty surprised to find out what the value on something like this is. Can you tell us a little bit more about in this condition and maybe versus mint condition? In this condition, um, you're probably looking at about close, you know, somewhere between I'd say five and six hundred. Uh, more than likely between five and five fifty, just in this condition, as long as you keep all the what you have left of the scabbard with the knife and keep them together. Um, you, you know, don't do any kind of, kind of crazy trying to clean it or restore it or anything like that. You could probably pull about five, five fifty out of this, um, a brand new one, completely mint condition or not brand new, but an, an original in mint condition, unissued mint condition. You could probably get anywhere from like this. Yes. 700 to $1,200 out of. Oh, it's incredible. Yes. Incredible. And so for for the people who do find one, maybe you just pick one up at a garage sale and you see it's rusted out. The recommendation would be to just leave it rusted. Don't don't try well, to clean any of that off. Or... There there is a way to do it as long as you you know you're careful with it and you know it. So what I if if I were to find one that had a lot of rust on it, um, at a, at a price that I was happy with, you know, the first thing I would do is bring it home and I would coat the whole thing in mineral oil or soak it. I don't know if you've ever watched any of Knife Delights' restoration videos. He'll take right. a knife and drop it in a bowl full of mineral oil. It's exactly what I would do with this because mineral right. oil is not going to hurt the wood. It's, you know, if anything, it's going to help help 
kind of revitalize the wood a little bit. And what it will do is it will penetrate that rust. And then instead of cleaning the rust off, because that's the worst thing you would want to do, you would want to take a rag, maybe some quadruple aught steel wool, if you're very careful, and basically just do wiping one single, you know, like one single movement, swiping it to wipe it. You don't want to take the rust off. You want to get it to where the rust is no longer active. And then you, once you've done that and you've got, you know, got it down to where it's basically black, the rust is still there, but it's black. That means it's, right. it's neutralized. You're going to want to take what's called Renaissance wax. Now this was developed in the 1960s in Great Britain. Um, museums use it. I don't know if I'm going to wash that out. There we go. Um, but museums use this and it's a microcrystalline wax polish. And what you would do is you would put it on about like you would putting uh, wax on a car. You're going to put right. it on a nice, nice, you know, even layer and you're going to let it kind of sit for a few minutes and kind of harden up a little bit. And then you're going to, you're going to wipe it off. Uh, whatever stays on there, you're going to want to leave on there because that's going to continue to protect it. Yes. You're going to have a rough surface wherever there was rust on the blade. That's okay as long as you've got the mineral oil soaked in it enough to make it inactive rust. Right. And this is probably true. Well, it is true for modern knives too. You probably don't want to store it in the sheath, although you want to make sure to keep that sheath as close to original as possible as well, right? Right. All right, cool. And then, uh, so do we know if the replicas that are being made today, are those interchangeable with the sheath if you want to carry and use this are they most likely to fit that or as far as i know from all the measurements i found at like mia or ima um they should be pretty in interchangeable um you know if you want if you had the the knife itself the dagger um and you wanted to uh you, you know you wanted to just put it together to look you know have a complete set still keep what you have of the scabbard of, of the original scabbard, but it should fit just fine. Right. Um, and that was one thing I think we had talked about a little bit earlier off camera is that the scabbard is worth almost as much as a knife. And so even in this condition, half destroyed, you want to keep that original yes. scabbard with the knife. Yes. Um, may maybe, you know, being like this, this may not be, you know, that, can be just as you know just as much or more than the knife right. itself because it is you know it is damaged very damaged <laughs> but you still want to hang on to it because no matter what that scabbard is going to be worth a whole lot more than if you went and bought a reproduction scabbard for it right yeah that you makes know. sense but like with um something like this i mean this one it's missing the strap which could have happened but this scat this knife will cost you anywhere from 60 to 120 dollars. This is an RH PAL 35 US Navy Mark One. See, there we go. Uh knife. And that'll cost you anywhere from 60 to 120 dollars. This one's probably right around the $70 range. And you're gonna pay 50 to 70 dollars for one of these that's original course it would still have the strap on it the retention right. strap but in this condition with that retention strap you're going to pay just about as much for this in this condition as you are for this in this condition right. so you know it, it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so find, find another good one if Here's you have it keep it basically <laughs> yeah if you have it no matter what condition it's in and i've got a few that are oops, i almost did that wrong that are uh in their original but somewhat rough condition uh sheaths here's a good example of one this is a cataragus 225q quartermaster knife as you can see the retention strap um here there is a part torn off that's not that should be a little bit longer i do still have that part um now i have treated this leather the best way i know how to preserve it um and then there's the knife itself. Of course, you can see the knife is in very, very good condition for being a World War II knife. Um, but I, you know, still have the original sheath. I keep this treated. I keep the knife itself treated with the Rinwax. Um, 
and I do have the piece that came off this end over here. Right. Um, in my display cabinet in the other room. But, you know, the, here's another one, all original, World War II, obviously in much better condition. You can see how long that end piece should have actually been on the other one. Um, and this is just an example of the difference, but even still with that original scabbard or original sheath, that knife would be worth way more having a bad condition one than it would if I were to buy, you know, if I were to have another sheath made or bought for it. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, anything else, uh, you're, you're probably know more about what we should talk about here. Anything we missed so far that you want to kind of revisit before we wrap it up? Um, again, other than, like I said, in 1940, when Germany took over, was finally over, able to overtake uh, Holland, <clears throat> these all became, these were confiscated by the German army for, again, ersatz. They were they were made into ersatz, which is, again, replacement, replenishment, supplement, supplementing their own, um, their own, uh, weapon, you know, their own kit, their own supplies that, you know, as they right. needed them. Uh, but I think it's important to note that a lot of the design features on this storm doll represent, and I, I, I we should, probably should have gotten some pictures of some other examples of like the case V42 of um, the British Fairbairn Sykes FS commando dagger, um, the French, I'm going to butcher this, the French Le Venjour, uh, combat dagger, and then later on, you know, the German SS and SA daggers uh, from from World War II Germany. Uh, there's a lot of similar similar designs in all of these knives, and you know, like I said earlier, they didn't quite. They, they were great for what they were meant for initially to injure, incapacitate, you know, in an offensive or defensive situation, but they weren't great field utilitarian knives you know that we ended up needing later on and that's why in the u.s we got rid of the case v42 in favor of the 1219c that we could open crates with and ration tins and beat tent stakes into the ground these just these uh, these knives like this one weren't meant for that they were meant right. for to have that super thin tip hopefully that's showing up a little bit the round butt on here and so yes. yeah not as much utility to this as mainly it, it was meant knife. It was meant for combat. That it's it's a fighting knife, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, awesome. I'll say I you, think I'll go for it. I'll, I'll say you've got a great piece. It's one I don't have in my collection yet, and when I seen it, I was pretty envious of that. Um, <laughs> appreciate it. But I, I appreciate you letting me be a part of this video on it. Yeah, yeah. I knew you had a lot more passion about it. Like for me, it has that kind of family history, but I didn't really know much at all of the other history. And so once you hopped on, I know you do your military Mondays. I thought it would be a cool way to get into kind of treat it like an open tag. I'm going to post this on Monday. I know we're not recording Monday, but I'm going to post this on Monday as a military Monday. I'll tag you. Make sure to check out his channel. I'm sure he'll be putting up a military Monday the same day on a different knife. So make sure to check that out. Anything else you want to plug while, while we're here? Uh, other than checking out you and Tim's show on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, check out mine and Randy's show every other Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, that's really about all I got. Awesome. Well, I'm going to wrap up record, but we can hang out for a little bit after this. All right. Appreciate it.